On behalf of the United States Institute of Peace, we are pleased to welcome everyone to this important discussion on economic security and stability in Pakistan and South Asia with His Excellency, Dr. Shaqat Tareen, Pakistan's Federal Minister of Finance and Revenue Affairs. The minister's visit to Washington comes at a critical moment when Pakistan and South Asia are rethinking many of their political, security, and economic priorities, and when the defining feature of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship is no longer the war in Afghanistan. It is within this context and knowing the direct link between sustainable economic development, stability, peace, and security that makes today's conversation so timely. During the next hour, we look forward to reflecting on a number of key issues, including the tough choices that Pakistan may need to take to restructure the economy, the potentially disruptive impact of the sharp rise in global prices of core commodities, and the possible impact of economic collapse in Afghanistan. We also look forward to reflecting on China's continued influence in Pakistan's economic development, and most particularly, the impact of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor on the partnership with the U.S. Mr. Minister, we are honored and delighted that you are here with us today. We note with appreciation your distinguished career in banking and your role as the Minister of Finance from 2008 to 2010 when your decisive leadership helped to stabilize Pakistan's economy during the 28 financial crisis. We are also delighted to have Dr. Peter Lavoie, former National Security Council Senior Director for South Asia, here with us to moderate a conversation with His Excellency the Minister and to take questions from our virtual audience. We invite everyone to share your questions via the chat function on our website, and we welcome you to follow discussion on Twitter using the hashtag at USIP Pakistan. Gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Tareen, thank you very much for joining us. I know you're in Washington at a very busy time, and it's a real honor that you could take this time out of your schedule to, to join us and talk about Pakistan's economic future. Uh, I have to say that I lived in Pakistan 30 years ago. It was one of the most wonderful experiences of my life. And at the time, I realized Pakistan had so much economic potential, a big population, a young population. The population has grown bigger, it's grown younger, but yet the potential has not really been taken advantage of. Can you tell us what you are doing and under the Imran Khan PTI government, what your team is doing to take advantage of the opportunities that you have in Pakistan to create sustainable, inclusive growth in the country? Thank you, Peter. Let me take you back a few years, a few decades. You know, Pakistan and U.S. has had, you know, very long association with each other. I mean, we at one time were also members of CATO and CENTO, and, and, and clearly one of the, the, the friends of uh, United States of America, which we continued over a period of time. Uh, in the 60s, Pakistan's economy was the fourth largest economy in Asia. Then we got hit by a, a nationalization of assets by Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto in 1973. And then we entered a, an Akwan War in 1979. These two events disrupted our economic growth. We lost track. We then, you know, we had a military dictatorship for 11 years, and then, you know, the civilians who came uh, actually did not uh, do justice to the economy of Pakistan. Now that, you know, we are here, Imran Khan took over an economy which was struggling in 2018 with a current account deficit of $20 billion, large fiscal deficit, and clearly not sustainable. So <clears throat> he had to go into a very tough IMF program, and he was doing fine. He took very difficult political decisions, 
on currency devaluation, increase in discount rate, increase in utility prices, all politically unpopular actions. As we were coming out, or rather consolidating and, you know, thinking that a year after we will start growing, happened COVID. And COVID was handled rather well by Imran Khan and his team. I think, you know, our performance in terms of infections and deaths, far less by standards countries around us. So Imran Khan, while being in COVID, kept investing in few productive uh, sectors like agriculture, industry, and housing. So last year, this fiscal year, which ended in June, Pakistan rebounded from a negative half a percent growth rate a year before to around 4% growth rate. We believe it's 4.5%. It's a 5% turnaround, 5% a V shape turnaround. Now, what we have done is that we have said that I think we have consolidated our economy. Now we got to grow because we have 60% of our population on the age of 30. They need jobs. So we have taken some steps, you know, to revitalize agriculture, industry, exports, housing. And we believe that this year we are going to grow by 5%. The good thing is that we probably are growing faster than 5%. But that also means that we got to make sure that we don't overheat. So Pakistan today is not only growing, but we have also decided, Peter, that we are not going to leave the underprivileged by the wayside. I think the, the underprivileged have been waiting for the trickle-down effect for too long. And because our growth has been cyclical and it's not been sustainable over a period of time, so trickle-down has never reached the bottom, the rung of our society. So we are going after the bottom-up approach as well, like Joe Biden. If, uh, if you, United States needs bottom-up, I mean, Pakistan certainly does as well. So that will help Pakistan grow, and will have an inclusive and sustainable growth over a period of time. That is the way we are, we are moving ahead. Thank you. And could you talk a little bit more about what the government is doing to help the poorer part of the population gain access to resources to allow them to grow? You see, we were always dependent on these banks, you know, large commercial banks to reach to the, the, the bottom echelons of our society. And we all know I've been a banker for 46 years now. It is not in their DNA. You force them, they will do, you know, some, uh, you know, kind of a short covering, uh, window dressing, as you call it. But, you know, actually, you, they will never reach. But there are other institutions. We do it, you know, for living microfinance banks, microfinance NGOs. And in Pakistan, we have some, you know, great leaders like Shoaib Sultan. Uh, and those are the people who have been doing this for 30, 40 years. And the return, you know, the recovery rates have been around 98 to 99 percent. So what I did was I asked the large banks to wholesale the funds to these uh, NGOs, these uh, microfinance banks, and told them to go and retail this. So what are they doing? So this is what your question is. Number one, they're going to go to the small agriculturists, you know, people with 12 and a half acres of land. They'll give them, you know, interest-free loans of, you know, for every crop, 150,000 rupees. There are two crops. Then they'll give 200,000 for mechanization. They'll go to people in the urban areas, give them half a million rupees, up to half a million interest-free loan to do the, their business. They'll give them money for, you know, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for their houses, 
they'll give you know a health card you know insurance and also technical training for one person now this is going to be a complete package you know for around 4 million households over the next few years so so i think that is pretty significant that would be that would be remarkable and i think the population i'm sure there are pakistanis that are watching this right now from their homes and uh, will certainly appreciate that now, you're here in Washington, D.C. at a very important week. This is the annual meetings of the, the World Bank and IMF. And as you mentioned, sir, the, under the Imran Khan government, negotiations with the IMF have resumed. And I think the sixth tranche of support might be in the offing. Could you describe what your mission is here and what you hope to bring home uh, from your visit to, uh, with, the, with the IMF? I, I think concluding, uh, you know, the sixth tranche through the IMF is, is the most important, you know, part of my visit. I mean, I could have uh, done the IMF, you know, meetings, you know, with, uh, and World Bank meetings virtually. But I've just come over here because I think we have completed the technical level, you know, discussions. And the final, you know, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the closure is going to be now um, talking over with the, the seniors at the IMF including the managing director. So I believe that uh, I think uh, progress we have made to date is pretty encouraging. And uh, as we say, inshallah, I see this uh, happening now uh, on this visit. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. um, if I could also uh, talk about a priority that the Prime Minister Imran Khan has announced, he talked about Pakistan being too long focused on strategic or security issues, geosecurity and is trying to pivot Pakistan's role in the region and the world to one focusing on geoeconomics. Can you explain what's behind that? What is happening behind the scenes to transition Pakistan to a vibrant, connected economy? And, and what should we begin to see in terms of evidence of that, that process working? I think we have to understand that Pakistan at you know, a lot of time in the past been looking through the prism of security. And I think what, they, what uh, the Prime Minister is saying that I think we have to look through the prism of the economic welfare of our people. And when you talk about, you know, so the, this kind of change in focus means everything changes in terms of your foreign policy and the economic policies, in terms of your, uh, you know, uh, internal security and whatever else, and your... <coughs> Uh, relationship with your neighbors. Uh, Imran Khan has visited more neighbors in the, the last one and a half years than the others did for the entire five years. So I think this is what we are doing. But, you know, we have an issue. And our issue is India. And India clearly is a bigger country. It's part of the SARC, you know, kind of uh, economic, you know, uh, block we have. And <clears throat> we... Uh, we, we probably are the chairs of SARC, but they will not visit us. So I think that is one area which we have to solve, uh, our relationship with India. Otherwise, I think, you know, our relationship with all our neighbors is, 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 is good and getting better. Well, um, we looking at South Asia for so long have been frustrated to see that South Asia is probably the least economically integrated region of the world. And, and there is an irony, you have the world's fastest growing big economy in India, which this year should experience somewhere between 9.5 and 10% economic growth. And, and invest, international investors are clamoring to, to uh, get into that, that market. And yet its trade and investment with other countries in the region is very limited. Are there opportunities you think that we could see in the next year or two of increased trade between Pakistan and India, for example? I think there's a fundamental issue between India and Pakistan, and that issue, that issue is Kashmir. The fact is that, uh, you know, we, we, we think it's a disputed territory, and obviously Security Council and several, uh, you know, resolutions have has said that. But somehow or the other, uh, this, uh, you know, government of India does not accept that, and they just, uh, I think they, they unilaterally, they, uh, they, they cancel all the privileges given to the Kashmiris. So we, we do not agree with that. The very fact is our trade is suffering, our economic 
you know, obviously cooperation with India is suffering. But I, I think the Imran Khan has offered, I mean, so many times to India, if they make, you know, take one step, we will take two steps. My own senses, I, through this forum, I'll once again request the government of India to just basically sit back and say that, yes, I think we have to cooperate. I can tell you I've been a city banker. I've got very, very good um, Indian friends. And when used to, we used to sit together, I think we used to, you know, always talk about that, you know, there's, a, there's just a border. I mean, both sides of the border, I mean, people live the same way as they live in India or Pakistan. So my own sense is, I think at political level, I think we got to just really give some space to the economics and the welfare of the people of both the countries. Again, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, could I ask you about the other side of Pakistan, yeah, near other border? You have a situation in Afghanistan where U.S. forces, uh, after fighting America's longest war, have finally withdrawn completely. You have the Taliban taking power, consolidating power. But at the same time, there's an emerging uh, horrendous humanitarian and economic crisis. Uh, how will that affect Pakistan? I mean, that, that has to spill over the borders um, 360 degrees around Afghanistan. And as you mentioned before, Pakistan dealt with conflict and the fallout of conflict in Afghanistan before. Um, how do you anticipate the impact on Pakistan today? I think the uh, situation uh, on the ground is, uh, I would say, pretty dangerous. <clears throat> the Ta Taliban's are in control, whether we like it or not. I think the whole world is saying the Taliban must have an inclusive government, a tolerant government. This is not only what the United States of America is saying, but this is what Pakistan is saying and every neighbor is saying. So we are trying that. I think we are trying our bit. I think there have been a meeting in Doha between the U.S. delegation and the Taliban's now. I think the, the noises are the right kind of noises. But we must understand that Taliban's probably running out of cash. And by end of this year, if the world does not get together to support them, on the humanitarian grounds at least, then there could be a complete chaos. And there could be a situation where maybe even the Taliban's may not be able to control. So what can happen is it will spill over into Pakistan. It will spill over all over the world. They will escape, they will go, and they will try to just, you know, reach Europe. They will reach whatever country they can, because if they're not getting, you know, uh, uh, two meals, you know, in, in their home country, they'll do whatever they have to. So my own request to the, the world would be that they see this, that this something has happened, they're making early noises of cooperating with the world. They're making early noises of being a responsible country. So I think this is when we should say yes. I think we let's help them step by step, you know, and, you know, a kind of uh, uh, encourage them as they improve their behavior, you know, or, or, or demonstrate their behavior. So Pakistan believes that, you know, if the situation in Afghanistan deteriorates, we will directly get affected. I think my former colleagues in the U.S. government, where I used to work, my colleagues that are still in the U.S. government um, are still holding out very sort of important criteria for that financial support to the Taliban government, that the Taliban meet certain requirements on uh, assuring the United States and other countries that they won't foster terrorist groups anymore, that they won't allow terrorist attacks to spill across their borders, that they'll respect the human rights of all Afghan citizens, and particularly allow girls to go to school and be treated fairly like uh, regular, like boys. Um, these are important issues for Pakistan as well. So how do you What's your advice for, to your own government and to, to others, to balance those foreign policy needs and requirements that we have toward Afghanistan, but at the same time recognizing 
they need money to deal to feed their population at this critical time. You know, Pakistan, like uh, any other country, as I said, wants an inclusive government to start with. I think, which means they, they cannot just have Pashtuns. I mean, they should be Tajiks, Hazarites, Uzbeks, and. Not only that, you know, they've already included them in the, the second rung of their, their, their government. We need to see those faces in the, uh, in the senior uh, echelons of their, their government. And then, as they have promised now, that they will basically also respect the human rights of the women and, you know, all citizens. We want a demonstration of that. And also, we want to see that uh, they, they, all the pledges they have been making that there will be no terrorism from the, the Akhwan territory, whether it is Pakistan, because we have Tariq uh, uh, ta Taliban Pakistan, you know, TTP, which basically launches attacks into Pakistan. We want those things to be stopped. So similarly, if we believe there's a good behavior, we'll probably, I think, oh, the world should recognize that. But as of now, the first thing is we should understand that they have made some promises and they made some moves. So let's at, at least look after their basic needs of food and some security, etc. I think we should basically start, you know, moving, you know, uh, forward step by step. And unless the world does not do that and pretty quickly, you could see some major disaster over there. Thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned TTP, Tariq Taliban, Pakistan. And uh, we've seen actually a spike in attacks in Pakistan since the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan and the uh, victory of the, the Taliban in, in Afghanistan. Um, I'm now working for a private company, and international investors look first and for, foremost at the safety and security of the country that they would invest in, secure and safe conditions. Um, I think international investors are now looking at Pakistan with a little bit of concern that uh, is there a new trend where TTP will be more prominent once as it was uh, about a decade ago? You're absolutely right. What has happened is that, you know, there are certain people who just believe in jihad, even in Pakistan. And so they've been lying dormant. But the very fact is they've seen Taliban, you know, actually succeed in uh, Afghanistan. And they've just been emboldened, you know, and they just believe that, uh, well, somehow the other jihad has won, which is what we are trying to now do is, you know, try to move in and just put the saner people, you know, in the center, kill this, this kind of, you know, spike, you know, from the uh, TTP and really just bring this in these emotions down. But it's bound to happen because they're Pashtuns both sides of the border, you know. So, so, so I think, but we, we, we are on top of it. Pakistan is, as of now, you know that we have fenced the entire border. You know, there's a small piece, you know, near uh, Chaman, which is not fenced. Otherwise, all fenced. We are controlling the, the uh, uh, traffic to and fro from Afghanistan, making sure that we are not getting the miscreants we used to get before. So we understand that, and our military and security forces are taking, uh, you know, the necessary action. Well, and, uh, Minister, you have to forgive me. I, I think I'm treating you more like the foreign minister than the finance minister. Uh, but, but thank you for indulging us with, with those uh, thoughtful responses. Going back to your area of, of focus and expertise, I noticed that in your, your past, you were a banker. Uh, you took a number of, uh, took leadership positions in a number of banks and were extremely successful. For example, the, the big Habib Bank, which was faltering when you took over and you turned it into a very profitable concern. Those practices worked well for you in the, in the financial world and in the private sector. How are you taking those practices in your approach to the Pakistan government to institute reforms in, in your country? You know, Pakistan's uh, uh, you know, uh, government used to be an employer of choice in the 60s. 50s and 60s, people used to, uh, you know, want to, to join government of Pakistan. 
When I was growing up, my father once took me to a friend of his who was a bureaucrat and who was a deputy commissioner. And he said, this is what I want you to do. Because the bureaucracy had merit, they used to have the empowerment and they used to perform. Over the years, the political, uh, I would say, leadership has destroyed that, you know, fabric of uh, bureaucracy. And we, the government of Pakistan, no longer employer of choice. We basically, we have interference. We do not allow them, you know, kind of freedom. And our compensation and others, they really, they're, they're not up to the mark. So what I've uh, what I bring to the uh, party is I have told the Prime Minister that we need to just reform the entire human resource aside of the government, which means uh, we got to bring in meritocracy, pay for performance, and of course, uh, all this uh, merit in, in promotions as well. And the compensation by itself must be benchmarked against uh, the market. You know, we know that uh, countries like Singapore, New, uh, you know, New, New Zealand and some Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries, they benchmark, you know, the, their bureaucracies against, you know. So that's what I'm trying to bring. But myself, what I'm trying to do is bringing in private sector people in key positions in the ministries where, you know, the skill set is not there. The, and we will then basically have a kind of combination of the bureaucracy, which understands, you know, the government, but also private sector, which understands the market. So bring in the market efficiencies. So this we have already started, as a matter of fact, in my tax regime, uh, a department which is Federal Bureau of uh, Revenues, there's a committee which has 50-50, you know, 12 people committee, six from private sector, six from the government. That's how we, we are going to start. And, and uh, my discussion with World Bank is I've said, please help me put some of these good people in almost all the major, uh, you know, ministries, and they have agreed. Well, that would be re <clears throat> remarkable. I know, again, international investors, I think, have been frustrated with Pakistan. They have to deal with ministerial fiefdoms rather than integrated entities that appreciate market mechanisms. And I think there's a real opportunity there. We came from an event at the U.S.-Pakistan Business Council. I, I think there are only about two dozen companies that are members of that. It's really an appallingly low number of American potential investors in Pakistan. That number probably should be two or three or four times as many. Um, are you hopeful that if you're able to implement these reforms, you'll improve the ease of doing business and be able to attract more companies uh, to invest in Pakistan? Peter, you know, what you have to do is basically go to, go to these companies who are in Pakistan. And I, I'm, I go to them now on a quarterly basis. You ask them what your problems are. They resolve their problems, they bring in more investment. And the other companies who are not in Pakistan will see what is happening, and they'll come, you know, and join you. So it's like, you know, the pigeons, they come one at a time. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly speaking, uh, you know, it takes time. And so we as Pakistan also had, you know, this uh, issue of terrorism. So foreign investors have been shy of going to Pakistan because of now that, you know, we, we have uh, security under control and we have a progressive, uh, you know, government. My own sense is if we take care of the problems of the foreign investors or all investors in Pakistan, you will see that, you know, the number of companies going to Pakistan will increase. I think you're right, sir. I think you look at Pakistan, it's the fifth largest economy in the world, fifth largest population, sorry, fifth largest population in the I world. I wish we were fifth largest. I know, I know. We need to work on that. Yeah. Um, and it's also one of the most youthful populations. I think the average, the median age is 23 or 24. So you have a demographic, demographic dividend that if you could take advantage of this, there's a huge market with, that has the potential for rising living standards, increased purchasing power. All companies would like to take part in that market and contribute to it. So I, I think, you know, I wish you success in improving the ease of doing business and, and you know, appreciate the prime minister's efforts to try to market Pakistan, the, the geoeconomics as a, as a growing concern and growing opportunity for investment. 
Um, but I think I have to say that the world community, the international investors, need to see a little bit more tangible process on reforms, progress, and to see that more clearly communicated. And I, I think opportunities like this where you can come out and talk to more investors are, are always good. Hopefully, with COVID now moving behind us, hopefully there'll be more opportunities like that too. Yeah, I mean, if you see that, you know, this year the World Bank has not come up with that index, but uh, in last year, you know, Pakistan jumped around 28 uh, places in ease of doing business. Uh, but also now, I think uh, the Prime Minister is now taking charge of this thing himself. So he's going to have, you know, the Board of Investment reside in the Prime Minister's office, reporting directly to him. And PM is going to take, you know, uh, these meetings twice, twice a month. Why? Because investors have met him, whether they are, you know, German, American, Chinese, and whoever. And they said exactly what you said, that, you know, uh, we don't see, you know, uh, on the ground the action which you, you have promised. So implementation leaves much to be desired. You know. So we will make sure now that the special economic zones and the problems of the, the, the foreign investors, they are, you know, given for, uh, for priority. And in the economic zones, we like to create an environment, you know, which is akin to their own, in, own, own, own country, which means the same kind of financial system, legal system, you know, labor laws, et cetera. And those... Uh, zones should be, will become autonomous. We will not have to depend on 16 different, you know, departments. So I think this is a move um, in the right direction. It'll take a little time, but my own sense is that what we'll do is we'll try on four to six uh, special economic zones within the next 12 months. And if they succeed, then we're going to multiply. Well, good luck with that. I think that's very important in the world. International investors are going to be looking closely. I know our company has uh, I see we have one question from the audience, and I encourage all audience members to send in their questions. Have you agreed to IMF terms on increasing electricity and gas prices, as well as increasing tax rates without real growth in GDP and per capita income? Well, our uh, GDP is growing, our per capita is also growing. The very fact is that you see when, when the IMF talks about, you know, the increasing the tariffs, we believe that if you increase tariff, you know, without, you know, uh, uh, structural uh, changes, uh, it only increase inflation is going to, you know, make your industry uncompetitive. But we also see the, their point of view. So what we have done is we have just done uh, some technical discussions with them and we will uh, increase, uh, you know, these tariffs in a gradual manner, thereby it does not increase inflation, you know, uh, a whole lot. Uh, but as the economy will grow, we have a problem on the tar in, in the power side that we have excess in our capacity, which I think previous governments, you know, built and we have to pay for the capacity payments. So without, you know, getting the economic benefit, we are pay making those payments. So as the economy grows, it will soak up that additional. And we also have to improve. Uh, the efficiency of these public sector companies, which is distribution company and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, the power generation companies. Uh, they are in the public sector. So I think all that is being uh, successfully uh, negotiated with the IMF. Uh, so there is no question of uh, that this stagnant, you know, GDP, uh, you know, per capita growth, because this year we will be growing at uh, around 5%. That's good. It's, I think the, the whole world experienced so much uh, loss, economic loss, uh, during COVID. And it hit the people that are closest to the subsistence level hardest, uh, including Pakistanis. And it's good to come out of that. And with the programs that you've talked about, aiding the, those that are most in need. Um, part of the <clears throat> economic reforms that I think your country is dealing with is now trying to speed up privatization. Um, as, as you know from your own experience, and you've been in public sector companies and private companies, they, they have two different cultures. And in today's world, it's very hard to see a country succeed if it relies too much on public sector companies. Uh, can you talk about the privatization priority in Pakistan? 
Um, should we expect other big companies to become privatized? And, and will that create benefits for your economy? Yeah, privatization is, you see, our, we have around 85 companies. And uh, there are only 15 of them, they have losses of 1% of our GDP. And this is really unacceptable. It's not a question of that we are losing 1% of our GDP. It's a question of that we could have had 2% of our GDP. So it's a 3% 3, 3 turnaround. I'm, I gave you the example of Habib Bank used to you know, lose 10 billion rupees a year and now makes 35 billion rupees of profit a year. So just a four times turnaround in, in a matter of 20 years. So the fact is that we could do the same with these companies, which are airlines, you know, railways, you know, steel mill, uh, dist uh, electricity distribution companies, etc. So we, I, I, I am a firm believer that in developing countries, business, uh, government has no business doing business. So we have to privatize them. Now the challenges are that the, uh, you know, their managements reside in ministries. The ministry would not let go the power of you know, not having them. So we have to first disassociate them from the ministries, bring them under a structure where the professional you know, uh, uh, group of people, you know, board of directors looks after them and they actually not only you know, stabilize them, but also privatize them. And this will now, this process has started, and hopefully you will see the major progress in the next three to five years. That would be, that would be good to see. And again, international investors, I think, are, are looking forward to that. Um, if I could raise a, a tough issue, um, media has reported that there are 700 Pakistanis that have been named in the Pandora Papers of taking wealth and putting it offshore. And this is at a, at a tough time when Pakistan needs that revenue, taxable revenue, to drive some of the economic reforms and, and policies that you're talking about. How can the Imran Khan government, which is so high on anti-corruption measures, how will it deal with this, as I understand there's an investigation ongoing? Well, there's a committee which basically will make sure that each one of those 700 people Whatever they have done, if they have this stashed money just to avoid taxes, it will go to the Federal Bureau of uh, you know, uh, Revenues. If they have just done some money laundering, it will go to the Federal Investigation Authority. And if they have done something, you know, uh, which is uh, uh, some corruption, it will go to National you know, Accountability Bureau. And nobody is going to be spared. I think he, he has made it clear in the Cabinet that whoever has done anything wrong, you know, some, whoever has done nothing wrong doesn't have to fear. But somebody who has done something wrong will have to, you know, face the consequences. So we will do that. As a matter of fact, uh, I think that process already started. Good. That will be good to see that, that accountability. Um, you're in the United States. We in the United States have a bit of an obsession with China these days. China has emerged as the peer competitor to the United States. And the U.S. has really reoriented its foreign and defense policy to focus on the competition with China in what the U.S. officials call keeping a free and open Indo-Pacific region. At the same time, Pakistan has improved its relationship with China, uh, which started back in the 1960s, but it's become very, very close. China is a big investor in Pakistan today. Um, are you concerned that the growing geopolitical competition between the U.S. and other countries on one hand and China on the other hand will create fallout for Pakistan or other countries in Asia? As far as Pakistan is concerned, our view is very, very clear. Our strategy is very clear. We want to be friends with everybody. We want to be friends with China. We want to be friends with the United States of America. We have been in major strategic partnership with the United States for the, the past many, many decades. So I think, you know, uh, our friendship with China is not going to just uh, uh, affect our, uh, our relationship with the United States. Uh, and we believe that we, we can work with both the powers, you know, and, and, and equally. China has helped us in uh, putting up, you know, this uh, infrastructure for us. And they spent, you know, a few billion do uh, dollars over here. Uh, and we value that. Uh, but that does not mean that, you know, we'll become China-centric. You know, I think this is what people have been uh, thinking that we will. 
So we are open. We want to be doing business with not only China, but United States, Europe, you know, kind of Japan and Korea, everybody else. So we are an open country. So I, I don't think there should be any misconception that we will, you know, kind of tilt towards one, one power or the other. Um, you mentioned China's infrastructure investment in Pakistan. Um, obviously, that's part of a broader program that China initiated many years ago called the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. And in Pakistan, it's the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is actually the biggest part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but this, this program has come under a lot of criticism or created a lot of controversy. On the one hand, the Chinese are bringing much needed infrastructure to developing countries like Pakistan. On the other hand, there are often strings attached. There are often um, environmental practices that might not have the highest standards or labor practices that might not be as sensitive to local popular uh, needs. And, and then sometimes there are financial implications that the loans that countries have to undertake to get this infrastructure create distress ultimately and impact the economy. Can you describe Pakistan's experience with CPEC and how you're able to navigate these challenges and come out ahead? You know, we had a need. We had a need that we had to build some infrastructure if we had to attract, you know, foreign investors and even our own investors. And we went to China and China said, okay, we are going to give you this kind of money, whether it's power generation or roads or railway and, and, and uh, other infrastructure. So they provided uh, the money. We actually have undertaken some projects. And then Pakistan was supposed to have these economic, uh, you know, uh, special economic zones, which would have taken advantage of these, you know, uh, infrastructure, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, projects, and then, you know, uh, generated economic activity. Now, I think China has done the, its bit, and I think uh, our process is very competitive. We have, you know, uh, uh, what we call, uh, you know, the competitive rules, PEPRA rules, and through which we just actually <laughs> give, you know, uh, the different... Uh, contracts and so they are all above board. It's us who really did not create the environment for the private sector to take advantage of this, you know, so. So we are lagging behind, you know, uh, you know, then the Chinese came in and they're very efficient. They just put up the infrastructure. We were supposed to take advantage of that. So we are suffering a little bit, you know, because of that, that, you know, capacity is there and we just, we just do not have the, the business to support that. It is our problem, it is not their problem. So I think, you know, they have done their bit and we are thankful to them because I think if they are putting 30, 40 billion dollars, no other country was willing to do that, you know, when we wanted it. So that does not mean, you know, that uh, we should start blaming them because of our own shortcomings. I, I think that's fair. I, I've got to tell you a, a funny story. When I worked in the U.S. government, I was authorized to reach out to China and in Pakistan, we, we met with the Chinese ambassador in Pakistan. This was at the outset of CPEC and offered for American companies to take part and, and jointly work on these infrastructure projects where you have bringing some of the state of the art technology and capital from, from US companies um, to, to match maybe the areas where the Chinese infrastructure development was, was weaker. But I think it was a real missed opportunity. The Chinese said, no, no, thank you. And I think they anticipated that things were going to get a little more competitive with, with the United States, especially in Pakistan. But I think that was a missed opportunity for Pakistan. If you could have Chinese companies and American companies working together with Pakistani companies for development projects, uh, it really would have been, I think, some remarkable outcomes. But I think, Peter, we did. There are, you know, we just in the uh, uh, kind of uh, electricity generating companies, Chinese companies went in and collaborated with GE. The GE, you know, kind of turbines, which were used in a big way, you know, and I know that uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, kind of, you know, joint ventures between the Chinese companies, the Pakistani, you know, the, the, the local entrepreneur and, and the Chinese. Uh, and, and the U.S. Uh, companies. So, 
there were, I mean, uh, some of these uh, collaborations. My own sense is that, uh, uh, I mean, we could, uh, there could have been more, uh, but uh, there were some and some large ones. Um, we see another question from the audience that uh, Pakistan, whoops, it just moved. Pakistan remains on the uh, Fatif gray list, uh, which means that Pakistan is not eligible for certain kinds of assistance that otherwise it would get and pot potentially subject to sanctions. Um, and they, many Americans and, and people from other countries believe that Pakistan has not done enough to counter terrorism and the support state sanctioned terrorism to deserve to get off that gray list. Um, and some would argue that Pakistan should be punished more. Can, can you talk about the steps that are being taken for Pakistan to get off the, the Fatif gray list? And um, are you hopeful that those steps will be appreciated? I think there were 27 conditions. And out of the 27, Pakistan met 26. One is half met. Any other countries which would have met, you know, 26 out of 27, uh, you know, kind of conditions would have been, you know, off the gray list long ago. Pakistan is being, I was punished by some, some kind of countries for different reasons, not economic reasons. And frankly speaking, it's the same mantra that, you know, basically Pakistan is a terrorist state. Pakistan, you know, encourages terrorism. A country which has lost 80,000 people because of terrorism, a country which has lost $150 billion of its economy because of terrorism, and the country which has, you know, suffered for, for 40 years, I mean, 50 years, uh, sorry, 40 years, 79 to now, 21. I mean, you know, we have been blamed for this. So I think we, we all know, sir, what, what is the agenda of some of the, uh, the, the people, you know, who are putting us in that, uh, that uh, spot. But uh, 26 out of 27, you know, uh, uh, kind of conditions have been met by Pakistan. So you cannot just say that we have not made, made an effort, an earnest effort. Well, I have to say, sir, that my wife sets about 30 or 40 conditions for me every day. And if I don't get 100 percent, I'm also in the on the gray list. So. <laughs> Sometimes you need to achieve 100 um, percent. I'd like to ask you maybe to reflect personally on what it's like to work in the government. I've, I've gone the other direction. I spent my career working in the government. I've come to the private sector. And I've got to say I really like it. I mean, I, I enjoyed I loved working in the government. But the private sector, you, there's a lot more clarity. There's a lot more market conditions are observable. There's less ambiguity. And you know, you know, rewards and punishments are, or penalties are, are very clear. The government is very murky. There, there are political motivations, bureaucrats try to protect turf as much as accomplishing objectives. How are you navigating that space? It's a challenge. Let me tell you what. Uh, my motivation is different. My motivation is I basically done, I had a very successful private sector career. I was Citibank and probably some of these banks. My father was one of those people who worked for the independence of this country. He was a doctor. And uh, I believe now that, you know, my, my children are married, I have to, for, you know, some do whatever I can to fix this country. And I, unless I just don't join the government, unless I just don't work with the government, I will not be able to do that. So I have a, a great leader because he's also a personal friend. He said, why don't you come and help me? I've said, absolutely. And let me tell you what, no amount of hurdles will stop us making Pakistan economically great again. One of the top countries in Asia first and then in the world. So in our lifetime, if we can make Pakistan, one of the top countries economically in Asia, that'll be an achievement. And that is my motivation. I think you should print hats, make Pakistan great again. They were, they were very popular in the U.S. for a while, and they might, they might be good in, in Pakistan. As you look at potential investors around the world, what, what country, uh, you know, if you're looking 360 degrees around Pakistan, where do you want investors to come in? Where do you think there's most potential and if you're successful in your job, you'll attract investment from this company, this country. Well, I think, you know, uh, what we believe is as of now, you know, our target, you know, is 
uh, we like to have all countries come and invest because we have the infrastructure. And the, the territory which we have around Gawada is unique because it basically covers, you know, uh, Gulf in the South, uh, Africa, uh, Central Asian Republics, then you know, Pakistan, and even, you know, the, uh, the distance between uh, Gawada and China is also uh, pretty short. So I think uh, any country can come and invest. As of now, the way we are, we are looking at is that we are trying to attract, you know, in those special economic zones, those Chinese jobs which are going to other countries, the 85 million jobs we are just, you know, basically sending to other countries, we are saying, please give us some jobs over here. You have created the infrastructure. But more importantly, we are just going everywhere. We are also going to the Pakistanis overseas Pakistanis who are really helping us. I think they have, they're helping us, as I said in the morning, that, you know, we have a trade deficit, you know, or almost $40 billion. They're covering almost 37 to 38 billion of that, you know. So that's huge. And, and so they also, there are entrepreneur, Pakistani entrepreneurs sitting outside overseas, and we are now trying to attract them to come to Pakistan, invest in Pakistan. Now, this is how the process will start, and then other countries will come in. But we are open to uh, investment to, you know, from for, for whoever wants to come in. Well, that's very interesting. You mentioned Gwadar. I, I thought Gwadar was, the Chinese viewed it as their exclusive economic investment zone. Is it open to other countries? Absolutely. I think, I don't think this is uh, Chinese-centric. I think this Gwadar probably has to be open to everybody. And we believe that, you know, whether the Japanese, the Americans, the South Koreans, or whoever, Europeans, for them, you know, if they want to do business with the Gulf, if they want to do business with Africa, and they want to do business with Central Asian Republic, this is the right place. Well, it's strategically located, and while Iran remains under sanctions, it, it really occupies a unique, unique place. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, though, if this, the instability in Afghanistan will scare away investors from Gwadar, because for Gwadar to realize its potential and, and reach into Central Asia, you need some peace and stability in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is definitely a, a, a challenge, as I, I told you, and I think a stable Afghanistan will be good for all of us. And unstable, uh, you know, Afghanistan is not going to be good for all of us. So I think we, I've been, as I said, I urge, you know, the world community, my prime minister is uh, doing the same, that let's not make, you know, Afghanistan uh, unmanageable. And I think that will not be good for anybody. You, you have to manage it. You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your neighbors. They're there. Yeah. Um, you're here in the United States. Um, you're going to meet a number of American officials as well as World Bank and IMF officials and other finance ministers from around the world, colleagues of yours. What do you, what message do you, do you bring to American officials and U.S. government officials? And I see in the audience we have a number of U.S. government officials. What would you like them to know about Naya Pakistan? <laughs> You see, I've been uh, with Citibank for almost 25 years. I think my children have studied in the U.S. I mean, we have been very close associates of the United States for, for decades, you know. So I think, you know, for, us, for me to sit over here and say that, uh, you know, we want to be friends with the, with, with the United States, I think is, 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 means nothing. We have demonstrated that, you know, we have stood by the United States in, you know, very difficult times. So we want to be friends with the United States of America. The very fact is that, yes, you know, we may have made some mistakes, but so has the United States. The United States can't say that they have not made mistakes in Afghanistan, but we may have also made some mistakes. But, you know, that's the reality on the ground is that the Taliban are there in, in Afghanistan. We are saying we'll move with the government, uh, with the rest of the, uh, the world in making sure that they have an inclusive, you know, uh, uh, government uh, and, and uh, proper, you know, uh, you know, human right, you know, kind of, uh, uh, they follow the, uh, the human rights for, for the women and everybody else. So we are on the same side. So United States should understand Pakistan is, the same Pakistan is still there. So I think let's join hands once again for the betterment of that region which will be for the betterment of the world. 
I, I would agree, and I think if there is some alignment on objectives um, on the on dealing with Afghanistan, there there are opportunities. And as I mentioned, having lived in Pakistan, you, you know, three decades ago now, uh, but travel there regularly, Pakistanis are still oriented to, toward the United States. There's more affiliation, allegiance to to, and and um, um, you know, positive feelings to to Americans whatever with CPAC and other sources and, and friendships that Pakistan was, has with other countries in the world, still the, the bond of friendship with Americans is, is going to remain strong. And, and I do think that, that eventually will prevail, but there has to be alignment on Afghanistan. And we're coming out of a period where Pakistan's policies and U.S. policies got very disjointed and created a lot of, a lot of friction. Hopefully that alignment will reoccur and will create peace and stability and a more inclusive environment in Afghanistan. I, I agree with you and I, I believe that, you know, it is in our interest, interest of both the countries to work with each other and to make sure that that area, part of the world is stable, does not generate, you know, the kind of uh, terrorism it used to and which is not good for Pakistan, not good for the United States or Europe or the rest of the world. Um, Mr. Minister, you're being very generous with your time. I have maybe one or two more questions. Um, one question came from the audience, and uh, it refers to the challenges faced by private firms trying to operate in, in Pakistan. And I assume that to mean both Pakistani firms as well as international firms. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but maybe you could you could reiterate this. What steps is your government taking to resolve some of the outstanding disputes with these firms? Maybe you could give an example of uh, one of the challenges being overcome. Well, I think uh, as I've told you that you know I've made it my policy to meet you know all the investors, whether they're local or foreign, uh, once a quarter. I mean, I just go to them. I don't you know ask them to come to me. And we have, you know, these councils which really work, you know, uh, regularly with the, the different parts of the, the government to make sure that we, we are going to uh, remove, you know, the issues which you know, people face. And there are issues, obviously, you know, uh, that uh, at times our bureaucracy doesn't move as quickly as they should. And, but we are doing that. The uh, ease of doing business improved by 28 points. I've told you the Prime Minister himself is now managing the Board of Investment personally. He reports directly to him. And with his, the Finance Minister who manages most of the economy, he's, he's also a private sector person. My own sense is that uh, things will improve. And as I told you in the previous meeting, that uh, the perception of improvement in Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, uh, improved overall by 59% from one year ago, and by 140, it was negative 74% a year ago, and it's positive 40% now, which is 114%, you know, by the foreigners. So something must be happening that, you know, the perception has improved over, over the last 12 months. If I could ask you a very specific question, Your, the Imran Khan government has two more years in office and there'll be elections in 2023. That means presumably you have two more years in your job. Who knows what hap will happen in elections? All elections are uncertain. Pakistani elections tend to be particularly uncertain. What do you hope to accomplish? Can you name one or two specific things you want to accomplish in the next two years that you're in, in the job? Well, for number one is that I want to make sure that we are on the path of you know, inclusive and sustainable growth. I think we take all those steps which uh, we have to to do that, so that the economy is growing at a four to uh, uh, five to six percent, you know, uh, growth rate. But I also want to accomplish is that want to have this bottom-up approach to make sure that the poor people of Pakistan they also get something out of this, because the poor people of Pakistan have been waiting for the last 74 years for this Manul Salba to come down to their level, and it hasn't. This time around. The government of Imran Khan is committed that we actually give them the break they deserve. 
Those are, those are very important words. I hope the audience has heard them. And I would just reflect again, Pakistan has one fifth, uh, or it's the fifth largest country in the world, fifth most populous country in the world, 220 million people or, or so. That amount of population, if they are successful, if poor people can, can escape poverty, improve their living standards, they can contribute to the world's future in a remarkable way. The world needs Pakistan to be successful. And I think we all appreciate that you're in the job trying to make that happen. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Peter. It's okay.